Good afternoon, graduates, and good afternoon, families, faculty, and staff. Uh, I was talking to President Allen earlier, and he said this morning is phenomenal. We had a great speaker. He was very humble from South, Af South Korea, and he was very funny. I want to warn you, I'm not going to be funny. Um, thankfully, Trustee Carroll was very kind as we were walking here. She said, the morning was fun. People had balloons, their families were excited. The afternoon is a bit more serious. So I think you and I are just going to get along just fine. Um, it is a pleasure to be back at Northeastern after 21 years. When you deliver a speech like this, you often wonder, what are you going to talk about? What kind of message can I give to all of you to carry forward from here? It's tough. You go back and forth in your head, back and forth, back and forth, and suddenly the light bulb goes off and you say, I know exactly what I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about suitcases. Um, I grew up in India. I spent 22 years of my life over there. And one day I decided to pack my suitcase and come to America. And when I came here, all I had was my suitcase and $100. Well, actually, I had $3,100, but I'd borrowed $3,000 from my father. These were his life savings, and he'd given them to me. My goals were simple when I came here. I had to get through two years. I had to make sure I didn't run out of money. I had to make sure I did well. And I had to make sure I was able to return his money at some point in time. Reasonably simple. Failure was not an option. I had to find a way. And the way I found was here. Northeastern was my Ellis Island. It is the place, my new home, getting off the E-Line on Huntington Avenue, looking for Dodge Hall with my suitcases. This campus, this school, is what introduced me to America. It introduced me to the culture, and first and foremost, what was going to be my future. And the key, the key to it all was my suitcase, because there was a lot more in it than just some clothes. When I showed up, I had my dreams, my aspirations, my hopes, and more importantly, my skills that were going to propel me into my new life. That is what I had brought with me. I had all that, but I also had the belief of my family. My father has give, had given me all his life savings. My mother was willing to let his son cross the seas, and my sister was sad to see a brother go. My family believed in me. They bet on me. They thought, I think they actually knew that I was going to be OK. There are a lot of people who bet on all of you, and I think they're here with you today. Your parents, your husbands, your wives, your significant others, your children, and your friends who were there with you who probably took you to Connors for a drink, maybe five drinks, when you're having a bad day. I think this would be a good moment to pause and recognize their support and contribution in your graduating today. Not just families and friends, I think now is a good time to also talk about people who supported you and me while we were at Northeastern, and in your case, you'll be graduating today, so we're at Northeastern. The teachers who, simple, who in simple ways guided you, guided me, helped us pack a lot more into our suitcases. In my case, it was Professor Harlan and Marjorie Platt. I had the privilege of learning from them. I had the privilege of working with them. I owe them so much. They even invited me to their home on Thanksgiving and made me feel extremely welcome. I'd like to do what I wasn't able to do well as I graduated from Northeastern. I would like to really turn around and thank the faculty and teachers for allowing me to be, to be who I am and guiding me at that moment in time. I'm sure each of you has a professor or a teacher here who has helped shape you and who, have, who has helped guide you. Please make sure you do what I didn't get to do before I left campus. Make sure you go and share your gratitude with them. I know graduate school is a choice, unlike undergraduate school, where I think most of us end up going. You made an active choice at some point in your career. You looked in your suitcase and said, I'm missing something. There are some skills, something that I don't have. I need to go to graduate school. I need to get those skills. I need to fill up my suitcase because I need to go do something different. And now you're here. You've packed a lot of skills in that suitcase. So as you walk away from here today, 
I want you to think. I want you to think, what did I come to Northeastern with in my suitcase, and what am I leaving with? And don't forget, every time things change in life, make sure you take stock and say, do I have that in my suitcase? As I was talking to somebody earlier this morning, they turned to me and said, you're lucky. I said, what did I do? So you're lucky, you get to come make a speech and you get a degree. We had to work really hard for ours. <laughs> we had to work for many, many years. I thought about it. Yes, I am lucky. But I've also spent 23 years packing my suitcase. So it's taking me way longer than you guys. You guys got yours in four or five years. It's taken me 23. So when you get out of here, you will go into many different fields. You'll go into finance, operations, marketing, computer science, management, consulting, all sorts of things. Some of you will start your own businesses. No matter what you do, you will start from the same place and end up in different places. So it's going to be hard for me to give you advice on what you should do from here. But I thought what I would do is I'll share some of the things I've managed to collect in my suitcase. So the first thing I want to talk about is if you set out to change the world or join people who aspire to change the world, you're more than likely going to make a difference. And I have the privilege and pleasure of working with the founders of Google. As many of you know, Google is not a normal company. We don't spend our time trying to solve incremental problems. We do something we call 10x thinking, which is we try and improve something by 10 times. Because if you set out to improve something by 10 times, failure is getting to two to three to five times. If you set out to improve something by 10%, you end up at a very bad number. So when you get out of here, use your power of imagination. Think about how to look at a problem that appears unsolvable and see if you can try and solve it. Think about turning it upside down on its head and see what you can do about it. It doesn't mean you're supposed to improve a solution that already exists. It means completely rethink the entire problem. A few years ago, I was on a plane with Larry Page and we were flying over the desert in Nevada where Burning Man happened. And he looked down, it was a clear day, and he said to me, it's quite clear. We could get a much better visual representation of the United States if we flew small planes over the entire country. I said, why would we do that? He said, well, you can get 25 centimeter type resolution instead of 50 centimeter, which you get from satellites. So in a few minutes, he's calculated on the back of a napkin how long will it take, how many planes do we need, how much money would it cost to get a clear representation of the US. And some of you might be using a feature on Google called Google Maps, uh, which allows you to do that. As we went up further, we were crossing a highway which is extremely congested. He said, do you realize because of human reaction times, there's 20% more capacity down there in the highway than people realize? I didn't know that computers react 10 times faster in breaking cars than you and I would. And hence, the beginning of the Google driverless car. I was talking to Elon Musk, who some of you might know as the founder of Tesla. He was over the other day and he says, I was telling him I have to come from New Delhi to Boston, uh, to Boston which I did this morning, it took me 20 hours. He said, well, we're soon gonna have something called the Hyperloop, which is a tube, I'll insert you from this end and you'll be at the other end 30 minutes. He wasn't trying to build a better car or a better plane. He was trying to change the future of transportation. In fact, he's famous for saying he wants to die on Mars and not by impact. So this is what I think you guys need to think. As you leave here, you have to think about how do you take a fundamental problem and change it. A big part of thinking 10x is learning how to live outside your comfort zone, is learning how to continue to take risk. I'm naturally restless. Every time I feel that something can be predicted, I stop and I change course. I get bored. Remember, it's OK to be bored. It's not OK to be boring. So in the height of the bull market, I was working in Boston in finance in 1999. And I could not make sense of the market anymore. I was on the buy side. And I decided to pack my suitcases again, and I left for Germany. And every day when I woke up, I would think, what, why did I do that? My life was predictable, I knew what I was doing. Why did I leave my family, take my suitcases, and head out to Germany? Because I wanted to do something different. I wanted to step outside my comfort zone. 
as we get older, as we go through life, we get more and more risk averse. As you go from your youth to your 20s to your 30s, and later, you have families, you have mortgages, you have kids, you don't want to move, you suddenly become more and more risk averse. I think what's important is as we progress through our careers, as we progress through our lives, it's important to not become risk averse. It's important to remember, you always have to stay slightly outside your comfort zone. There's a quote that I love. It goes, a ship in harbor is safe. But that's not what ships are built for. So don't go out there and stay in your harbor. Get out there and explore the world. Take disproportionate risk. Google would not have existed. Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, every new company out there would not exist if one or two people had not gotten restless, decided to leave everything they were doing, and stepped out of their comfort zone. So if you're thinking you're going to leave here and go into a comfortable job, and life will be wonderful ever after, don't think that. Go out there and live outside your comfort zone. You guys are in an enviable position. You can take risk. That's what you should do. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't stepped out of my comfort zone multiple times in my life. If you don't jump, you're not going to land on your feet. If you're not brave, you never know. You're never going to know. I was with Eric Schmidt once in New York City, and we were talking about something basic. And he says, Nikesh, learn how to keep saying yes. Embrace yes, don't say no. Once you say yes, you always have the option of saying no later. When you say no, it's very hard to go back and say yes. It feels like you've lost faith. So remember, say yes, you can always say no later. So that's not just the way our biggest problems are solved. The only way our biggest problems are solved is if you step out of our comfort zone. You cannot make progress if you're not willing to solve problems of scale. You have to laugh at the impossible. Laughing makes me, reminds me of something else you guys should remember as you leave here. Laughing reminds me of having fun. What's very interesting is, as we grow older, we're taught the concept of work. Work has to be serious. Work has to be boring. If you're having too much fun at work, you're not working. There are work times and play times. When you're kids, now you have to work, now you can play. And slowly as we grow through our careers, it's ingrained in our lives that you have to work, work is serious, you go to work, you come back home, you relax, you have fun. You don't relax at work. It's a bad idea. I had a job where I wore a suit every day. I sometimes felt I was wearing a costume. When you wear a costume, you start behaving like the actor who's expected to behave like you are in the costume. If you take off your costume, you can be who you are. When you leave here, remember, life is about having fun, not just about work. Now at Google, we have ping pong tables, and we have circular balls, and lava lamps, and all those fun things. But that's not what fun is. Fun is about enjoying your work. Fun is about making sure that you're solving big problems of scale. Fun is about trying to see if you can change the world. If you enjoy your work, you're going to have a lot of fun. It's not just about ping pong balls and lava lamps and round gym balls. So when you leave here, make sure that you're in an environment where you're having fun. As my daughter would say, YOLO. <laughs> for those of you who understand that, what that is, very good. For those who don't, find somebody 16 years or younger. <laughs> so as we talk about work and fun, What's important is to keep your inner child alive. When we're kids, we have lots of fun. We take risk. Uh, I don't know if many of you have kids yet, but if you do, you're always trying to stop them from running out on the street. You're always trying to protect them. You're always trying to inhibit their creativity. I work with a guy at work called Matt, and he's a creative type, and he writes for a living. And he said to me as a three-year-old, and he says, every morning, my three-year-old comes up with a concept which breaks all barriers and extremely creative and sometimes the mother tries to rein in the creativity, when you, especially when you use crayons to write on white walls, then you rein in creativity. You don't want your walls written on. But his point to me was he wishes that he was as creative as his three-year-old today because he works in a very creative field. So as you leave here, don't forget, you have childlike tendencies. We've spent years trying to train you away from them. Just make sure you can go find your inner child when you leave here. Now the question is, where do you go from here? I know many of you will go into different functions that we talked about, but I live, I live and breathe technology. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about technology and the power technology has in our lives. I know President Owen talked about Boston. 
right now is a good time, right now is a good time to mention that we are in Boston. You all have been the center of attention on a national scale. As scary as the events of the day of the marathon were, for people who were watching it from afar like me, I can only imagine what it must have been for all of you, real Boston strong. While we mourn the tragedy and senselessness of the bombing, I think it's also important, in a way, to celebrate some of the positive outcomes. The unity of a city, a nation, defiantly brought together by those who sought to break us apart. I'm sure you feel a sense of camaraderie with your classmates, with the city. Please hold on to that. That's rare. We should keep, keep it as you progress through life. But it's also important to celebrate the impact of technology, the crowdsourcing, the digital imaging, the well-enabled citizen journalism that ended up not just catching the perpetrators, but also telling us the real story of what happened here. That's the thing. Technology is here. It's here to stay. I was sitting about three years ago with my father, and my daughter was trying to teach him how to use email, and he was resisting it. He said, I already know how to call you. I'll just call you. I don't have to learn how to email. And she sort of gave him an, gave him an ultimatum and said, you want to stay in touch with me? You better learn how to use email. So now he uses email. And I was sitting in the other room, listening to this part, listening to this exchange. And I, I live and work in technology, and I was kind of getting tired of every new app that shows up, every new thing that shows up. The day I figured one thing out, there's a new thing. And she says to me, Dad, email is for formal communication, and Facebook is passe. Now, the new thing is Instagram or, Instagram or Vine. So as I sat there and listened to that exchange, I reminded myself that I was not going to stop learning. I was not going to stop experimenting, because if you stop experimenting and stop learning, you run the risk of being passe, just like email. So please don't do that. We are in a world where technology is going to keep changing. It's going to move faster and faster. We're going to see a whole different social structure as a consequence of technology, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or whatever platform you have, Google+. Technology is going to change our lives. So as you go out of here, even if you don't work in tech, I urge you that you stay tech savvy. Information has the ability to make us very different as a society, very different as every business out there. So as you leave here, I'm going to ask you to do a few things. First, make sure you bring joy to your others through your work. Your most profound joy will come from them. Give the world what it doesn't even know it needs. Give it the hyperloop. Make sure they can get from one place to another in 30 minutes. If you see it as a problem, it is a problem. If you find a flaw, go out and fix it. If you believe it's missing, go out and invent it. Don't just set out to change an office or company. Set out to change the world, because you're more than likely to have an impact. Make sure that your adulthood is a happy childhood. With that, most importantly, keep packing new skills into your suitcase. There's no limit to what it can contain. You've already got so much in it, but please do not stop putting more in it. Take it with you everywhere and see how far it takes you. With that, congratulations, graduates, and good luck.